Now, the last part of this class, which I wanted to end with, is the miracle of the Holy Quran. So, the miracle of the Holy Quran. One of the characteristics of the definition of the Holy Quran is that it is inimitable. It is not, we can, it is not able to be copied. It is a miracle. And this is called the Ijaz of the Holy Quran. This is a characteristic called Ijaz. The Ijaz is an essential feature of the Holy Quran and it refers to the inability and uniqueness of the book such that no other book can mimic it. That's what we mean by the miracle of the Holy Quran. The Prophet ﷺ said to his companions, every single Prophet has been given miracles which led people to believe in them. Every single Prophet was bestowed a miracle which led people to believe in that Prophet. I was given disp divine inspiration as my miracle, so I hope my followers will outnumber the followers of all other Prophets on the Day of Judgment. Because the miracle that Musa salam did when he separated the river and all the other things that he did with his staff, those only a small group of people were able to witness. And so they became his followers and then subsequently they were not those people. The miracles that the previous prophets performed, they were for a particular group of people. The miracle of the Prophet wasallam was the fact that the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was preserved. And that was bestowed upon not only the people that were present before the Prophet ﷺ, but also for the subsequent generations that were co to come after them. And so that's why the Prophet ﷺ said, every single Prophet was given a miracle or a set of miracles in order to cause people to believe in him. My miracle was di divine inspiration. It will continue until the Day of Judgment. So I am hopeful that my followers will outnumber all the other followers of the Prophets on the Day of Judgment. Because our miracle is continuous. Our miracle, the miracle of the Prophet Wasallam, is present in the house of every single Muslim. Now, there are various aspects of the miracle of the Qur'an. There are very a various aspects of, of the book that make it so miraculous. Number one is the language and the style of the Qur'an. The language, the linguistics of the Qur'an make it a miracle. And the proof of this is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in several places within the book challenges the people and says, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبٍ مِمَّا نَزَّلْنَا عَلَىٰ أَبْدِنَا فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِّن مِثْلِهِ وَدْءُوا شُهَدَاءَكُمْ مِّن دُونِ اللَّهِ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ فَإِن لَمْ تَفْأَلُوا وَلَنْ تَفْأَلُوا فَاتَّكُوا النَّارُ الَّتِي وَقُودُهَا النَّاسُ وَالْحِجَارَةُ وَإِدَّتْ لِلْكَافِرِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if you have some doubt about the book that I'm revealing, then produce something like it. Bring something that's similar to it. And call all of your people together and try to produce something like it. Not only can you not do so, you will never be able to do so. And if you, so therefore you should accept the book and then the ayah continues. So this is the proof of its miracle. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stood up and challenged all of humanity to produce something like it. And no one has ever been able to do so up until now. And no one will ever be able to do so. And look at the way the challenge is being phrased, subhanAllah. فَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا وَلَنْ تَفْعَلُوا And if you have not been able to do so, and you will never be able to do so. Now think about it this way. If you go to your chemistry teacher, after you finish an exam, and you say, here, find a mistake. Find a mistake in this exam. After you write the exam, imagine how the teacher will respond. They'll say, well, I'm going to look at this case test twice and pick out a mistake. And then if you say, find a mistake, you're never going to find a mistake. He's going to sit there and look at that test until he finds a mistake. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is challenging humanity. One thing he's say, Allah is saying, you can't do it. And then he's saying, you'll never be able to do it. And still, despite the enormity of this challenge, no one in mankind despite the greatness of their linguistic ability, has ever been able to copy the linguistics of the Qur'an. Forget about the content. The content in and of itself is supreme. Just the linguistic style of the Holy Qur'an. So that's the first and foremost miracle of the Qur'an. The second miracle is the fact that it would prophesize future events. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for example states in Surah Al-Rum, in Surah Rum, غُلِبَتِ Rum. فِي أَدْنَى الْأَرْضِ وَهُمْ مِنْ بَعْضِ غَلَبِهِمْ سَيَغْلِبُونَ What happened at the time of the Prophet ﷺ is that there were two major powers. One was the Persians and the other was the Romans. 
the Persians and the Romans. These were the major powers at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. They would often battle one another and often it would come up in a deadlock and no one would win the battle. The Sahaba and the early believers, they took sides with the Romans because the Romans were at least people of the book. And the Kuffar, they tended to psychologically side with the Persians. So when there was a battle and the Romans would win, the Sahaba would become happy. And they would say, SubhanAllah, Allah helped the people of the book over the, idol over the people of fire worship. And when the people of fire worship would over overcome, the Kuffar would become happy. And they would say, SubhanAllah, or they would say, this is a proof that Allah is not helping, but the, the, that the, the worshipping of other things besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had power and came into play here. On one occasion, the Persians defeated the Romans to such an extent that they went into their capital, which was Jerusalem, and they ransacked the place. They completely trashed the Romans in this battle. And they had no hope, they had, the Romans had no hope, they had completely been overtaken. The Sahaba became very dejected at this. Very dejected because the Kuffar were now saying, look, where is your Allah? Where is your help? No one helped these people of the book. And so they became very, very dejected with this event. What happened then was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recited these ayat. And in these ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Rome has been conquered. Rome has been defeated in a particular place on the earth. But after a few years, they will become the ones who will redefeat the Persians. And that was unimaginable at that time. Let me, let me give you an example. It's easy to understand in this day and age. If I say to you, the Soviets have been defeated. But in a few years, the Soviet Union will defeat the United States, you would all say, there's no way. There is no way that could happen. That's, uh, that's unimaginable. The Soviet Union has been completely wiped out. It's, it's all broken up and fragmented. Their economy is disjointed. They have no power. They can't even suppress rebellion within their own land. How will they be able to defeat the United States, the superpower of the world at this point? But that's exactly what occurred at the time of the Prophet them. The Romans were so defeated that there was no hope for them to retake and reconquer their lands. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prophesized the event and then within a few years it actually occurred. Fi bid'i sinin, just within a few years, less than 10. And in fact, seven years later, the Romans actually conquered the Persians and defeated them. So that was a future prophecy which existed within the Holy Quran. So only the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could prophesy something that made no sense to the people of that time. And not only that, but they lived through it and they watched the prophecy come, come through. The third is the effect, the third miracle of the Holy Quran is the effect of the Quran on the hearts of people. SubhanAllah, this is one of the most unique aspects of the Holy Quran. What did the Kuffar used to say about the words of the Holy Quran? What was their description? They used to say, In hadha illa sihrun yu'thar. Verily, these words that the Prophet ﷺ recites, they are nothing but magic. Why? Because they would see that there would be these people who were completely lost and misguided. They would fight with one, one, with one another, they would kill their daughters, they would become drunk with alcohol, they would waste their nights in song and dance, and they would hear a few ayat of the Holy Qur'an, and their lives would change to such a degree that they would begin to pray tahajjud all night. And they would begin to share their wealth. And they would begin to change everything about them for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They said, this is not any kind of normal word. Normal speech does not change human beings from one extreme to the other. But this is some type of magic. There is something magical about these words. The kuffar themselves. The kuffar themselves called the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which flew from the tongue of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam magical. Because of the effect that they had on the, on the sahaba of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. SubhanAllah, these words are magical. These words do change people's hearts if a person's heart is ready to receive, and that person is willing to make the change, then these words will change someone's heart. And look how they changed the Sahaba. They changed everything about them. They changed the way, it changed the way they thought. It changed the way they fought. It changed the way they, they interacted with, with one another. It changed their dreams. It changed their aspirations. That's a big deal. It's easy to change somebody's mind, 
But for them to change their aspirations, their goal, they no longer chased the goods of this world and their eyes were placed on the hereafter because of the effects of these words. So subhanAllah, there is a power in these words which no other words have. And this power does not only affect a group of people in the Arabian Peninsula which, who understand the language of the Quran, but it transcends, it enters Malaysia, Singapore, India, all these places throughout the world where the language is not even spoken, it transcends beyond linguistic understanding and it enters into the hearts of varying cultures and varying people throughout the entire world and changes nations, not people, not families, not cities, nations. That's the power of this word. When somebody inculcates it within them, they become a group of people who change nations. SubhanAllah. Despite the fact that they didn't even understand the Arabic language, it had such an effect that it would just change these people or even or it affected people in such a way that their character would then go out and change other people. So that's the third miracle of the Holy Quran. The fourth miracle of the Holy Quran is the fact that its descriptions fall in line with natural science, number one, and number two, they don't contradict natural science. So there's two separate issues here. Number one, you don't find any contradictions of the Holy Quran with natural science, despite the fact that over 1400 years, natural science has made incredible progress. The scientific revolution that's occurred over the past 500 years, that has completely flipped the knowledge of mankind. In fact, the knowledge of mankind doubles every two or three years in the realm of science, and the Quran still maintains its level of truth and still completely conforms with, scientific, with all scientific thinking in this day and age. Almost all. And whatever it doesn't conform with, those theories will eventually be proven false. That's the history of science. Where a theory arose in the history of science, and it contradicted the Qur'an and the history of the Qur'an, eventually that theory was shattered and a new theory took its place through scientific revolution. That's the miracle of the Holy Qur'an. Number one, it doesn't contradict. And number two, it actually supports. One thing is to not contradict, and number two is to support. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ Quran. Don't they contemplate on the Qur'an? And if it was revealed from someone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اِخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا They would have found many discrepancies within it. See, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ فِي الْقُرْآنِ أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنِ Don't they think about the Qur'an? We're not like the other deens. We're not like the non-Muslims where they say, well, you just have to believe. We don't live in a box of darkness. Allah says, open your eyes. Look at the world. Explore it. Interact with it. Study, with, study it. And you will only find that it verifies the Holy Quran. We don't live in a dark box. Allah doesn't tell us to live behind shades. Allah challenges us. Afala yatadabbarun al Quran. Don't they consider and contemplate and reflect upon the depth of this book? That's because it's been revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the universe. He created the laws of the universe. And the Quran is a representation of the ultimate reality of the universe. So in the end, if science truly seeks the truth of the universe, it will only lead the people to the doorstep of Islam. There's no other way. Allah created the universe and He revealed the Quran. The Quran is merely the laws of the universe outlined in words that we can understand. They're, they're all congruent together. And we don't have time, but you could literally have a whole five-day series on just the scientific miracles within the Holy Quran. For example, the Holy Quran describes the fact that everything is made from water. Who 1400 years ago would have been able to tell you that every single thing is made from water? It's only today that we've realized that 90% of our bodies are made from water. And that all other organisms, Water is the majority component of every living organism. It's today that we learn these things. It's in this scientific revolution that we've come up with this knowledge. Furthermore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes embryology in beautiful detail. Beautiful detail. In fact, when I was in the second year, first year of medical school, there's a book that we study in embryology called The Developing Human by Kenneth Moore. In that book, Kenneth Moore outlines the embryology that he was able to compile through modern science. And he says in his introduction, 
He says that I read the description of embryology in the Holy Quran and I began to use the terms of the Quran in my teaching of embryology. This is what he himself says. The master of embryology, which almost every medical school in the United States and Canada uses his book to teach embryology, he himself says that exactly as I found the descriptions of the Quran of embryology, those same terms I began to borrow in my study of embryology. And it's beautiful because in, in, in his introduction, he goes through the science of the history of embryology. He says the Greeks used to think that the, the, uh, that the fetus is just created as this tiny human being which eventually grows. But he then eventually reaches the Quran and he describes what the Quran says about embryology and shows that the Quran describes the fact that it's a, it's a, uh, it's a little clot and that clot has three layers and those three layers eventually clothe the new human being etc step by step by step and it's all described in the Holy Quran amazing that Holy Quran which does not even describe the Salah you can't find how to pray anywhere in the Holy Quran that same Quran is describing the ultimate reality of the universe by describing the in-depth detail of the stages of embryology and again that's a separate discussion but the point is is that this is the miracle of the Holy Quran that it describes the laws of nature and what exists in nature exactly as it truly is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is both the creator of nature as well as the revealer of this holy book so basically I don't want to go into too much more detail because I, I think we've gone over time but the essence of this series that we covered over the past few days for Wahi is that we begin to appreciate what Wahi truly is. And the reality of Wahi is that it is the secret of our deen. This is the magic of our deen. This is the miracle of our deen. This is what converted people to our deen. This is what brings people into the deen. This is what allows you to progress within the deen. It's the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I felt that in this day and age, looking at my own life, looking at my own life, I felt how unfortunate it is that I've interacted in such depth with so many other books besides the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only because I lacked an appreciation of what Wahi truly is. And so I thought that for myself and for all of my brothers and sisters, it would be beneficial that we talk about Wahi and actually truly understand what a great blessing it is upon us. All the way from the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided to reveal Wahi upon us, to the great night which changed the history of mankind with the revelation of the first wahi upon the heart of the Prophet wasallam, to the subsequent preservation of that wahi in the current form in which we recite it and then the fact that to remind us of what a miracle wahi truly is. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to interact with this wahi, to inculcate this wahi, to share this wahi and to enact our lives according to this wahi. This is what the Prophet ﷺ was. He was the Qur'an walking upon the earth. And in this day and age, it's true, people don't read the Qur'an, but I saw such a beautiful billboard. I hate billboards, and I hate these things that people put up, these little slogans, but it was just such a nice slogan. They said that, it was, it said that people will not recite, people will not, in this day and age, basically the gist of it was that in this day and age, people will not recite the book so the only book they'll read is you. Meaning in this day and age, we're not going to be able to hand the Qur'an to a group of people. They're not going to just pick it up and recite it. But what the Sahaba realized and what the Tabi'een and Teba Tabi'een and people after them realized is that they became the Qur'an walking. And when they became the Qur'an walking, people read them. People read their mannerisms. People read the way they interacted with one another. People read the greatness about them and that attracted them to the deen. They were the Qur'an walking on the earth. Why? Because they emulated the Prophet ﷺ and he was, according to Aisha radiallahu anha, the Qur'an walking upon the earth. So this is what we have to become. There's no other way around it. You're not going to spread Islam by handing out pamphlets. And you're not going to spread Islam through websites. And you're not going to spread Islam the way it truly should be spread through phone lines and faxes and emails. You're going to spread Islam in yourself by inculcating the Holy Quran within our lives and then to others by them interacting with us. See, we're the interface between the people and the Quran. Eventually when they come into the deen, they'll read the Quran and they can overlook the, the inconsistencies within us. And they'll have a deep and respected interaction with the Holy Quran. But to get them there, we are the portal. We are the interface. Remember we talked about this great interface that existed between humanity and Allah? 
in the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam it allowing the wahi to achieve to reach humanity well in the same way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created each and every one of you in this group as an interface for the rest of mankind they're not going to pick up the book they will not be able to interact with the book until they see you they see it in us they see us walking and then they say what makes this person so unique why is it that this person isn't depressed and I'm sitting depressed all the time why is it that this person is always so happy why is it that this person is so just why is it that this person is so calm no matter what difficulty arises in his life? How can I be like him? This is how the Sahaba brought people to Islam. They didn't hand out pamphlets and books and give lectures. They would just go in front of people. And people would say, how can I become like you? You're the most amazing man I've ever met. You're the most amazing woman I've ever met. These are the most amazing children I've ever met. And then the Sahaba would just say, Kunu mithlana. Kunu mithlana. That was their dawah. Kunu mithlana. Be like us. So make yourself similar to us and people would come in droves people would come in droves into the deen based on their inculcation of the holy quran in their heart so that's the exact responsibility that befalls us that's the message that i want you to take take away from this series you can take a lot of notes and you could write down the way it was compiled and the four sahaba who did this and the three sahaba who did that and that's all fun and games that's history those people passed they did what they had to do they earned their reward the responsibility is now upon us to carry this to the next generation. And that's going to come through opening up the book and sitting down with it. If you don't have the ability to do it alone, find a teacher, someone who will discipline you, someone who will sit with you in front of the Holy Quran. And inshallah, over time, you will eventually develop a deep relationship with it. It will overtake you. And when it overtakes you, it will overflow from your heart and begin to flow into your community. And when that happens, that's when miracles begin to occur. And that's when you begin to experience, not read about, but experience the miracle of the Quran in your own daily life. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to develop such a relationship. Wa akhira da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.